Can you tell me when it's the light that's up there? Oh, that's the projector. That's the best. Okay. Go check it out. That's okay. Super bright. Hey, mind your language, we're on YouTube Live, by the way. Oh, we're live right now? Well, for you. All right, fine. Um, how, how do I look? I look yeah. good? Let's go ask him, uh, All right. Yeah. Welcome to the 2022 California National Party Convention. We'll be starting in just a few minutes. I want to remind everybody out there, all of our Red Star Rebels, that if you subscribe to our YouTube channel, every subscription allows more people more people to tune in to this convention live here on YouTube. Because, like I said before, if you want an independent California media channel, it's all about the algorithms. So, the convention will start in just a little while, but I'm just gonna keep this thing running. So, enjoy. Now, the question is, can we hear? Can you, can you go on YouTube and uh, double check to make sure that we're streaming? Want to make sure the microphone's working, and that we're picking up what we're picking up. That's a good sign. So now I'm waving to double check the sound. Can you hear me out there? Of course it is. Well, it's not recording, it's live streaming. So whatever's happening now is happening now. Yeah, now as in now, now, right, now. Soon. Oh, everybody knows the movie. Oh. Actually, if it's better, that's better. So are we getting sound? It's loading. Yes, we're hearing. Okay, good. Thank you. That's. Yeah, when that comes on, actually, that is bright again. It is so lovely yeah, yeah, when yeah. I feel yeah. competent. If there is a, there's a JPEG that says like Southland. Let yeah. me show you. Like that one's a lot darker. Well, also, I mean, we're about to start, so, um, right, we're starting. Yeah, but I mean, think we can just put that. Can we just put that JPEG on or no? Sure. Put it on. Okay. Now I need some cutting of our theme music. Look, we're taking pictures of ourselves. Ooh.
Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Can we, are you hearing okay, or there might just be? Nothing's on. Nothing's on. Um, give me when the wireless comes up. Okay. Is it working now? Can you hear me now? All right. All right. That most professional at this, so please bear with me. This is volume up. Okay. Is it here? Testing. I just pull it out. Just switch it up. Switch it off, take it out, put it down. Turn it turn it off. This one was on volume. Hello? Yeah. No, that one's way better. Okay. Let's go to this. I don't know if I can make this more awkward. All right. Here we go. We've got some volume. Thank you all for joining us. This is the 2022 August Convention of the California National Party. And again, everyone who's coming, all our guest speakers, all our members of the California National Party. And to start it off, we have our first guest speaker, David Lawrence from Long Beach uh, Grocery Co-op. So let's give him a hand. <laughs> okay, we've got this all paid the volume. with Long Beach Grocery Cooperative. Get uh, a little bit of legalese out of the way first. Uh, Long Beach Grocery Cooperative itself does not represent any political party. But being that said, I'm here to talk about cooperatives and how uh, Long Beach Grocery Cooperative came to be. Started for me, my cooperative journey started in 2009. My wife and I were on a trip to Portland, Oregon. And when we go on a trip, we just kind of walk around cities and look at the architecture and everything. And we were hiking around and we were thirsty and hungry. So we saw a little grocery store, a little grocery store. So we said, let's go in there and get something to eat. So we walk in, like, walked in and something felt different about this store. It just felt different. Uh, than the normal store. You know, it was small, we were in Portland, everything was really progressive there. You know, they had a really, really good produce section. Like, what is this? So we ordered a sandwich, we ordered some, something to drink, and we went to the checkout. As we were in the checkout, the, the cashier says, are you member owners? And we looked at each other and we're like, okay, I knew this was too good to be true. It must be some kind of ownership market that's only you know for the neighborhood. Or it's like no, no, no. You can buy, you can buy this stuff, but this is a co-op. And my next question was, well, what's a co-op? And there was nobody behind us in line, so he proceeded to explain to me what a co-op was. So I had a business degree. Um, and going through, you know, call myself a pretty progressive person, and I did not know what a cooperative was. Had never heard of it. And so that, that struck me. And I was like, well, you know what? That's probably just a, a Portland thing to do. Like, it's a really progressive here. I can see why they had that. We don't have those down in Southern California where I'm from. Yeah. Fast forward to 2000. 15 or so. And uh, in Long Beach, we were dealing with a lot of blight, especially in my neighborhood. We had several storefronts that used to be grocery stores that were in. And we, as a, as a community, were kind of we were getting together to see what we could do about it, see how we could change that. And so uh, we met, the community organization met, and said, well, how are we going to handle this? And I said, well, you know what, let's start you know, reaching out to different stores, Sprouts, 
Trader Joe's, because we wanted something healthy for the community and everything else. And so we did. We started a letter writing campaign to them and everything, and they responded back. And the response was, you, your area doesn't meet our demographic needs. So we're like, whoa, okay. And then at that point in time, I went right back to that store and walked in the port. And I said to everybody, I said, well, well, why don't we start a co-op? And you know what their answer was? Well, what's a co-op? So I was like, okay, so I said, like, I don't know how to start one, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna research it and, and I'll get back to you guys. So I went home, I was thinking about it, went home, went to my computer. The first thing I did was type in food co-op, hit enter, hit images. Almost knocked me off my feet. I had no idea that there were almost 300 food cooperatives up and running in the United States. All over, Midwest, everything, you know, every other place. I looked, they really, uh, right, because I was like, okay, they, they can't be in the South, right? Food Corp cannot be in the South. This is very progressive. The South is not that progressive. So I went to Texas and I'd like to see if there was any food co-ops in Texas. Sure enough, there were. Wheatsville Food Co-op in Austin, Texas. And so I continued on. This just really intrigued me. How are we in space in Southern California, one of the most progressive areas in the nation, and we don't have any food co-ops. What is this? What's going on? And the more I read about food co-ops, the more it just made sense that we should have one. And why don't we? So I went back to the group and said, hey, this is, this is what I found. And they said, let's, let's do this. Let's start it. So we started out saying, OK, we got to figure out. We don't know what a food co-op. We didn't know what a food co-op is. So we need to know if our, you know, you know, how many people in Long Beach know what it is. So let's go out to uh, test it out. We'll make a booth and we'll, you know, we'll label it Long Beach Grocery Cooperative and just talk to our neighbors and, and see what they think. So we went to the most progressive um, trade show or show or community, community event that we could find. It was a Green Prize Festival and uh, it was around Earth Day. So we go, this is a really progressive crowd. Long Beach is already progressive, but this is a really progressive crowd. They're gonna really know what a co-op is. And so this will be an easy way for us to, to break in. So we set up the booth, it was very nice. And uh, about six of us stayed out there all, it was an all day event. And my goodness, we sat there and what was the biggest question we got? What's a co-op? What is a co-op? Over and over and over again, we got that. What is a co-op? So we're explaining to the people and everything. Once they, once they were explaining, they really liked the concept. So we're like, after the day was over, we were dog tired. We were talking to people all day. Um, and we realized, it's like, okay, this is gonna be a lot of work. We got a lot of education to do. So we went on a year and a half of just doing events, just talking to people. And we turned what was initially what is a co-op into, okay, well, how do we get it done? Where is it going to be? So that's, a, that's the, the basic. But it took with my studies, I really was intrigued by this concept because it, it was something that had hit me for all my years. And so I looked into it and I was like, okay, why? Well, you know, when I looked, especially like in Wheatsville in Texas, I started researching it. I said, all right, man, Wheatsville, what's that mean? And um, I looked into it, and it was named after James Wheat. And James Wheat was a freedman from, from Missouri. Uh, and he had traveled to Texas and was able to buy a plot of land in what's now Austin, Texas. And he was able to, he was a carpenter as well, 
So he started to build a small township in Texas. And through cooperative economics, he was able to expand that. They had a grocery store, and they had uh, other you know, businesses there and everything else, and they kind of you know, just kept to themselves a township of about 300 people. I was just amazed by this. And they, they named the store the Wheel Co-op after him and his struggle. And they ended up having to, they ended up taking that land by eminent domain, okay? And now that's where part of the University of Texas stands at this point. So that really intrigued me. And as an African American man, I was like, you know, our history runs through cooperatives. And we have a rich cooperative history, and, we, and I never knew about it. Again, something I did not know. You know, when we talk about the Tulsa Race Massacre, and I looked at these things and said, well, how were they able to amass, build these cities? How were they able to, they couldn't go to a bank and get loans, but how were they able to do it? Cooperative economics. Cooperative economics. The power of it. And that's when I understood why we aren't taught cooperative economics. Because that's, as a people, that's where power lies. Power lies in us coming together. And even if we just have a little bit, we can turn that and make that into a lot. And so I was like, wow, these, this is really, it's, it's, I really kind of understood where we were as a society. Because these lessons were not, were not being taught to us. So it's, a, it's been, a, I can tell you, it's been a, a real journey, a real learning experience for me. And I studied cooperatives all over the world. And without question, once they're up and running, the hard thing is getting them started, but once they're up and running, they definitely do perform. Some of the big cooperatives, are in, you, like REI, is a cooperative. Okay. Who's able to compete in the sports business at this point in time with Amazon and everything else? What business is still open? REI. Amazing. True value hardware. Who's able to compete with Home Depot? On price and everything else. They have a buying cooperative that they buy from. I did not know that. So this is the competitive edge for we the people. My thing is that why haven't we taken over our food system? The corporate food system that we have right now leaves a lot to be desired. It's pretty much a monopoly. Two, three, four companies own all of the food. Except for cooperatives. The power lies within us to change our own food system. It's the simplest for us to take over. It's the simplest to take over as a people. Because what actually is a grocery store? But a conglomerate of other people's labor put on a shelf. Very few things are made in the grocery store. They may make some bread, they may make a million things up, but everything else is somebody else's labor, somebody else's business. They just bring it in, put it on a shelf, and check it out. And they make billions of dollars doing that. When Amazon bought Whole Foods, that should have been, that should have been the ring of the bell that sent everybody running. It's total control of, our, of, of what we do and what we eat, how we nourish our bodies. We have the ability to take control of that. So Long Beach Grocery Cooperative is a 900 grocery cooperative. 
in Long Beach, California. It's been seven years to get to that point, which if from here out, if uh, we should have a way of making sure that communities that want grocery cooperatives that want to do something like this, it does not take this long for them to get themselves organized and on board. A lot of it has to do with money, of course. You know, a lot of these things are self-funded from the members. But we need to start developing ways on a level, on a local level, on a state level, on a national level, so that we can push this forward and take our food system back. At least a portion of it. They're making billions of dollars. Take some of that money back by having our own community owned stores and recycle some of that money back into our community. Nourish our bodies and nourish our community. And we can leave, you know, the billion. Honestly, because they have enough. They don't need any more. But we have serious issues in our cities that we, just by buying our groceries, can help solve by redirecting that money into, you know, into our community. Co-ops, that's what it do. It's like, one of the first things I did when uh, the idea came was look to see where my closest co-op was. I did not know. And it was in Santa Monica. Co-opportunity in Santa Monica. So I drove down there right away to check it out. Walked in and I said, something's got to be wrong here. You know, I was very skeptical when I walked in. And I said, you know what, I'm just going to go and I'm not going to tell them who I am. So I acted like a shopper. I walked in and I was kind of going to shelves. I saw a guy stocking shelves. And I was like, this is a cooperative. He's like, yes. I said, how do you like working here? He said, he stopped what he was doing. He said, you know, this is the best job that I've had in my life. He says, I've worked for a Home Depot. I was a manager at Home Depot. I left there to come here. So I took a little bit of a pay cut when I came. But it's still the best decision I ever made. I've learned so much when I was here. I was a manager at Home Depot. Now I'm a stock person, but I've learned so much about my body, about nourishing my family and everything else. He says, you know, my, my uh, benefits are amazing. These workers, the workers that work there, they have full medical benefits, vision, dental, everything, with a living wage. It's like, how can that be? How can that be? How are we not doing this? How are we not? Every community should have a food co-op. Everyone. That's how we keep our corporations honest. They have to compete with we the people and what we're doing and the standard that we set and how we want businesses to operate in our community. I mean, it's very important. So now, because they don't have a whole lot of competition, so who's going to be the competition if it's not us, we the people? It's left that at this point. And the advantage that we have is that we can go to local purveyors. We can go to a local farmer. We're on that scope. They can't operate on that scope, but we can. And, we, and it's a multiplier because now we're feeding into our local economy and strengthening it. And there's so many examples of the work. We're just here in Southern California, we're in a cooperative desert. And the other parts of the country are really 
making this happen and doing it. Minneapolis, St. Paul, 13, excuse me, 14 co-ops, 14, New Mexico, Albuquerque, neighborhood, New Mexico, seven, La Manita, they have seven stores, Austin, Texas, two stores, Wheatsville, Long Beach, none. Say none, none. And I'm none. Torch, none. How is that? We have to uh, get on board with what's going on in the rest of the rest of the nation, including Northern California, and start with food co-op. This is one thing, but other cooperatives as well. We don't have any worker cooperatives, very few in this area. Nationwide, we don't have that many, but we need to start propagating more. And so the, I am a firm believer in worker cooperatives as well, but we have to have some basis of, of, of education. And I thought that, you know what, the best thing to start, the easiest one is a food co-op. So people have some knowledge, you know? They start, they start off with some knowledge of what a co-op is. So when you go to a group of workers and say, hey, let's start a co-op, now they're not asking the question, what's a co-op? They're like, okay. They're starting, well, okay, but how do we do it? But, um, I mean, it, so it's a, a membership to the co lifetime membership, that's how co-ops work. Um, and it gives you a vote in the co-op. You vote on the board of directors in the food co-op, and it's run volunteer or anything like that, especially here in the state of California. But I just find it uh, um, very intriguing. It's been eight years of education, eight years of, of you know, we finally, we finally have reached a point to where we have a location. Carson and Bellflower in Long Beach. So we, you know, we reached that, that pinnacle. Now we're three months away from starting our build out or we'll do a capital campaign. We've got to raise a lot of money in order to get this uh, cooperative. We will do so. And uh, let this be the start. And hopefully, hopefully, my dream is, is that this spurs other cities in Southern California to do the same. That they do the same. And we have a strong network of food co-ops here, like we have in other places in the country. So again, my name is Damon Lawrence from Long Beach Grocery Cooperative. Um, Really thankful to be able to come and speak to you guys today. Um, this is a uh, this is amazing, actually. Uh, the, a new party is is coming about, and you know it's it's. I think that it's it's time. It's actually time. It's new ideas. It's a new passion, and, uh, and you know, new ideas out there. Thank you very much. near and dear to the California National Party. Uh, cooperatives is part of our platform. It's one of our ideas that we want to get forward. Uh, we want to have a democratic economy in California. And again, I think you did a great explanation. So thank you again, Damon. Uh, next up is a person who ran for Long Beach City Council, endorsed by the California National Party. Uh, Carlos ran in the uh, Long Beach City Council primary election back in June. And came in second place. So again, I'd like to welcome him to the floor. He can speak about his experiences trying to run uh, under the edges of a new party and try to get something done here in Southern California. So Carlos, when you have a chance.
morning, everyone. Um, can you hear me? Yes. So, um, uh, you know, they tell me not to ever say this, but uh, I, I go ahead and say it anyway because it puts me at ease. I'm, I'm not a good public speaker. I stutter and stumble on my words, and I forget what it is that I'm supposed to say. And uh, this time I have a little outline, hopefully it helps me, but uh, even after a few speeches uh, during my campaign, I still, you know, suffer the same things. I know, I know the stuff, I just, it's, you know, fear of uh, facing public. Even though, uh, you know, we have a small public, and, uh, but, you know, knowing that there's potentially thousands of people watching this uh, somewhere. Um, Anyhow, um, so again, my name is Carlos Ovaid. I am an architect and a community advocate. Uh, I'm not new to politics. I uh, grew up in politics. I, uh, in fact, I grew up in Guatemala uh, in conditions of almost continuous uh, civil war and uh, repression. Uh, a country that was governed by, well, and still is to an extent, by uh, by Washington D.C. Uh, you know, so whenever we had a, any a semblance of democracy arising, uh, people's choice, uh, you know, it would get squashed. Uh, here, the the you know, things get squashed in a, in a different way. Over there, they literally get squashed. Uh, my dad was one of these uh, people who were very vocal uh, against the government. Um, and he did that um, contrary to advice and the pleadings of his uh, friends and family and, uh, and uh, my mom. And as a result of that, um, there were a couple of attempts on his life. The first time they ran him over in a car. Uh, the next time they attempted to behead him, uh, he managed to survive uh, with severe injuries. Uh, but as a result of that, uh, our family ended up emigrating to the US on an emergency visa. So. In, in um, you know, I, I was forced to grow up very fast. As, uh, as a nine-year-old, I, I had to help uh, nurse my dad back to health while watching my younger brothers, and uh, my mom had to go to work uh, to make a living. So eventually we came here. Uh, we settled in Wilmington, which uh, uh, a part of Wilmington that eventually uh, got incorporated. Um, uh, you know, we learned English by immersion, all of us. Uh, we, uh, my school uh, didn't have a single Spanish speaker. So it was difficult in terms of language. It was also difficult in terms of culture. Uh, and discrimination that uh, you know most immigrants face. Uh, on our way here, we actually drove through. We we took the long way. We drove through El Paso, and this is this is a story that you've uh, probably heard before. Uh, it's very common among immigrants who travel through uh, Texas, and you know we stopped by a convenience store that had a sign that said. Uh, or dogs allowed. So I had to go back and ask my dad uh, what that meant, and uh, it, it didn't look good. Uh, but, um, but at that point, I, I kind of began to understand what discrimination means. Obviously, that continued while I was here. Uh, but, and it, and, it, and it continues to this day. Uh, it's very subtle for you know, people who are uh, Anglo 
and native English speakers have a difficult time uh, understanding it, but it does exist. So anyway, uh, I realized I was a socialist from a very early age. Socialists were the only ones that uh, paid attention to my uh, family when we first emigrated here. Uh, they, they understood, uh, and, he, and my dad understood, the class nature uh, of society. Uh, and um, so I grew up around books by Marx and Engels and Lenin and Trotsky and other stuff. Uh, but, but, I, but I was never really, you know, deeply involved in politics. Uh, in fact, n not at all. Uh, I never belonged to a party. When I became a citizen and I became, and I started to vote, I, I, having that background of growing up in a socialist household, uh, led me to kind of see through all the bullshit. Uh, can I say that here? Yeah. Uh, yes. And, and, uh, uh, and so I didn't belong to any party. I was always no party preference. Uh, at the same time, I didn't have the discipline to belong to a uh, uh, socialist party. I, you know, party discipline is something that any kind of discipline, discipline at all. Uh, anyway, um, so always, always a rebel. Uh, but I did uh, do things that, you know, uh, everything I did was geared towards my my deep beliefs. And so, as an architect, I'm an architect. Uh, as an architect, I uh, I, I started uh, my my first job was designing. Uh, homes uh, for veterans uh, uh, that were financed by by uh, FHA, and uh, and I continued to design affordable housing um, up until very recently. I retired as of yesterday, uh, and uh, I I uh, participated in many nonprofits. I I designed. Uh, uh, homeless shelters, uh, shelters for victims of domestic violence, and uh, you know all sorts of other things that uh, that uh, were not very, uh, uh, you know, they didn't make me rich, uh, as opposed to some of my other uh, classmates who designed, you know, luxury stuff. But anyway, it's what made me happy. Uh, Eventually, that led me to uh, Nicaragua. Uh, you know, I was always paying attention to the plight of uh, countries that were suffering the, the, the fate that my country suffered in its civil war. And so at some point, I decided um, to, to go to Nicaragua and volunteer my time. I had had a little bit of military training, and so I, so I thought, okay, the Contra War is in full swing. I wanted the government of Nicaragua to hand me an AK-47, and I wanted to go to the front lines. <laughs> uh, you know, ideal, idealist, uh, young revolutionary. Uh, instead, they found out that I was an architect and that I was fully bilingual, and so the government of Nicaragua. Uh, assigned me the role of being a translator for one of the ministers, and they also gave me a full-time job as an architect, because all the architects had fled the revolution and went to where the money was. Um, you know, that's my profession. It's, you know, next to prostitution, it's the oldest profession, but we're all prostitutes uh, in that sense. You know, we, we go where the, where, the, where the money is. So, so I stayed in Nicaragua for a little over a year. Um, working as an architect, as a translator, and as a bicycle mechanic, my other passion. Uh, and, um, and it was very eye-opening. Um, uh, I got into trouble with the Sandinista government because 
I, they had a belief in a mixed economy. Uh, they, they wanted to, they felt that, that having uh, cooperatives, much as the uh, previous uh, speaker was talking about, was the solution. And I thought, no, you, you have to go all out and, and do a socialist revolution and be like Cuba. And so that got me in, that got me in trouble with the Sandinistas and they, uh, and they, they actually threw me in jail for a day. Uh, but uh, it was all good. In the end, um, you know, after that time I, I came back, I wasn't making any money and uh, student loans to pay and while I was there I got married and, you know, uh, my salary in Nicaragua was $35 a month. Uh, which, you know, is if, you know, in the late 80s, uh, even, even in a country where things were heavily subsidized, that was poverty wages. But anyway, came back and continued doing what, what I did before, um, architecture for the public good. And, um, you know, still paying attention to uh, world politics. Um, and, um, uh, at some point, I, I kind of got burned out with uh, with world politics. You know, the sort of the bigger you know issues, the Middle East, Afghanistan, and Iran, and all, and you know, uh, Latin America. And then I started to pay a little closer attention to home, uh, Long Beach. After living in Wilmington uh, for a couple of years, uh, we moved to Long Beach and uh, I've lived in the same neighborhood with little breaks here and there. Uh, and, uh, and so what it, it, my, it caught my attention that one day Mayor Garcia, our mayor, soon to be congressman uh, in, what is it, the 42nd district? Um, he uh, proposed uh, to increase term limits from two terms to three terms. And the way he worded it was very deceptive. He called it strengthening term limits, which is a term that has been borrowed by other uh, cities. Uh, uh, what was that city that, uh, that just recently increased term limits? Linwood. Okay, so Linwood. Um, increased our term and they used exactly the same model you know I'm, I'm sure they consulted with him uh, strengthening term limits how does you know if if you have a nation of what, what do we have 300 million people and if we're able to run it with two terms why do we need three terms for a city of less than half a million people you know it was bizarre it seemed very authoritarian and having come from experience with authoritarian countries, uh, it didn't smell good to me. So, so I launched a, uh, uh, a petition uh, which was uh, unsuccessful, but it did draw the attention of Mayor Garcia, who asked to meet with me and my brother who was helping me with that petition. Uh, he met at our home and he when, when it became apparent that we were, were not buying his bullshit, um, he attempted to bribe us. He offered us seats in his commissions in, uh, in exchange for dropping our, our opposition to his term limit extension. It wasn't just that, he was, there were also a few other measures that he was proposing at the same time. Uh, in order to curtail opposition, he also, violated the Brown Act and the First Amendment by limiting our speaking time. So in the required hearings, we were only given 36 seconds to speak in opposition to each one of those items. I mean, 36 seconds is nothing. I mean, you basically introduce yourself and, and that's it. So it became very, very apparent that, uh, that Garcia was an authoritarian. And I'm sure he's going to continue that uh, once he makes it to Congress, if he does. Hopefully not, but, you know, that's kind of how, how it's uh, looking. But it wasn't just him, it was the entire city government. And 
you know, keep in mind that that most of the city government in Long Beach is uh, progressive Democrats, um, you know, darlings of the Democratic Party and uh, and of the Squad and all that kind of stuff, you know. So it became, you know, very apparent that it's not just Mayor Garcia, it's not just our council members, it's the whole Democratic Party. Obviously, the Republican Party has the same sort of issues with their sphere of influence, but basically, I became more convinced than ever that the Democratic Party and the Republican Party are uh, basically one and the same. If you look at the corporations that uh, fund their campaigns, that contribute to their campaigns, Sometimes it's the same corporation contributing to both sides in the same race, such as PG&E. You know, uh, what is PG&E doing? Uh, you know, funding these campaigns. What is like Koch brothers? You know, the famous you know quasi-fascist supporters of Donald Trump doing funding the campaign of Nina Gonzalez? You know, darling liberal progressive uh, Democrat you know it's it, it's if if that isn't sufficient evidence that points to the parties being the same thing you know two sides of the same fucking coin you know I want my own coin you know uh, so I'm proud to say that as of yesterday I changed uh, other than the significant event of uh, filing my retirement paperwork, I also uh, changed my registration. Uh, I am now registered uh, California National Park. Uh, I, I, have to, I have to say that I am not entirely in agreement with the entire platform. I, uh, for, and for, as I was uh, mentioning to uh, Sean from from uh, the very first time we met, uh, this issue of independence uh, is is a little bit foreign to me. Uh, but uh, but still, um, you know, I I find that it's that I very much appreciate the California National Party uh, supporting uh, my campaign. Uh, and I'm in agreement with uh, it, the you know the platform as uh, deals with uh, fair housing for all, uh, health care, and uh, political representation. Uh, so those are the things that I that I mainly agree with. And uh, and you know it's it's very difficult to run a campaign as a party preference, even though if no party preference was a party, it would be the largest party in, uh, in, in, in the U.S. Currently, there are about 40% of uh, voters uh, registered as no party preference versus 30%, approximately 30% Democrats and 30% Republicans. So that's what the California National Party has to do, is to capture that, capture that 40% of voters that have been disenfranchised uh, by the two sides of the same coin. Uh, so I didn't get asked to talk about any of that stuff. Sorry, uh, I got asked to talk about my campaign. So, so my my campaign uh, was a grassroots campaign, uh, and because of my uh, uh, few years of of um, as as a uh, as a community advocate. In, in Long Beach, it was very clear that the status quo was afraid of my campaign. They did everything in their power to squash it uh, from the beginning. Uh, I was fighting against a, an incumbent with name recognition, uh, with, uh, with a part of a 16-year dynasty. His wife served two terms. And now he served two terms. Uh, so, so just in terms of name recognition, it's tough. Uh, even though people in my district, uh, particularly in my neighborhood, knew me because of my 
you know, life there uh, in my activism. But uh, on top of that was, uh, you know, the money issue. Uh, I raised a little over $9,000 uh, for my campaign. Uh, the incumbent had uh, well over 100000 uh, including uh, some of the uh, independent expenditures by by unions and by the Democratic Party that uh, that uh, that I still got my hands around, um, but uh, uh, on 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 top of that, there was opposition from in terms of like almost a total blackout. The press covered almost all the opposition candidates, but not one article mentioned me. They mentioned me just sort of as the a person who is opposing the incumbent, the Democrat, uh, long-time Democrat, uh, labor leader, blah, 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 et cetera, uh, uh, you know, the incumbent, but not, not, not once did my name appear in the press. Uh, when I filed my papers, the city attorney opposed my candidate designation on rules that they made up, in fact, they made up along with a firm called uh, Best Best and Krieger. It's a firm uh, of a uh, uh, law firm that uh, that assists uh, many cities around the Southland. I think maybe even beyond. But they do they they do all the nasty work that the city attorneys don't want to do. Uh, so they made up rules for why I couldn't have my ballot designation. And they just made them up on the spot. But they wouldn't even let me look at the rules, citing attorney-client privilege, so I couldn't even fight my designation. Uh, at that time, I was a member of the uh, Democratic Socialists. I had been a member for a couple of years. They, uh, in spite of being uh, a, a lifelong socialist, they they claimed that I belonged to a couple of right-wing groups, which they never cleared up what those right-wing groups are. I mean, if you think right-wing groups, you would think I was a member of the, the Nazis, the KKK, uh, you know, I mean, uh, what, what are right-wing groups? I mean, people think the worst when they, when they, when they say somebody is a member of a right-wing group, and yet somehow they, they claimed that I was a member of right-wing groups. They claimed that I had endorsed somebody in a campaign for mayor that didn't even exist. I mean, they told me, it's like, you know, it's like very Kafka, you know. Uh, the Democratic Party came out and, uh, and actually put out hit pieces against me, mailers claiming that I had called uh, President Biden a rapist and other things that they just like pulled out of thin air. Uh, the uh, councilman's uh, uh, wife uh, filed uh, claims against frivolous claims uh, with the FPBC, meaning that I had to spend time and resources fighting that. Anyway, it just sort of went on and on. It was like swimming upstream, and it was basically uh, a solo campaign. Uh, with uh, help for, from uh, the Lorfo city right there, and uh, and a couple of other volunteers, um, and very little money. Uh, and despite having uh, been outspent, outspent uh, like something like twelve to one, I still managed a decent showing, a uh, little over thirty percent of the vote. The incumbent is 58 percent. Unfortunately, if uh, there was no runoff, which would have given me another opportunity, uh, because he did uh, exceed uh, 50 percent of the vote. But uh, but it was clear clear that um, you know that they were going all out to beat my campaign. Uh, I'm gonna try again, if not directly myself, uh, uh, supporting another candidate. 
but I think I learned a few lessons um, in this campaign. We don't need to, to, to be, we can't, we will never, as CMP or, or no party preference candidates can never make the same amount of money uh, that, uh, that, uh, that one of the corporate parties uh, will raise. We will always be out uh, 10 to one or 100 to one or 1,000 to one. Uh, so there have to be other, other, other means. Uh, but they all require uh, people power to back us up. They require, uh, they require a party. Uh, I would never do this again solo. Uh, if I do it again, I uh, hope to count on the CNP uh, to, to, to back me. Uh, and if uh, it's another candidate that I'm supporting, I will push them towards uh, doing it uh, along with the party because I'm not going to support anyone who doesn't believe in my core values, which are similar to your core values, to our core values. Um, you know, and uh, uh, the, the one, one of the other lessons that I learned was, you know, as uh, growing up as a socialist, you know, uh, the first words out of my mouth would be something like, you know, death to capitalism, you know, or uh, defund the police, um, you know, or fuck the police or whatever. But uh, you know that's not that's not really going to get us anywhere, uh, and I and I and in this campaign I I managed to convince a lot of people since I had no party affiliation I was approaching everyone Republicans Democrats uh, Independents and uh, and I and it was uh, uh, I I managed to convince almost everyone that I spoke with regardless of what party or whether they were liberal or conservative, uh, that defunding the police, yes. I didn't use defund the police. Uh, I used other words such as, you know, we need to be socially, fiscally responsible with how we spend our money. It's more fiscally responsible to spend money on public safety, on issues that actually resolve crime as opposed to fight crime after it has happened. And so using words like that, I, I managed to, to, you know, Republicans, Democrats, it didn't matter. You know, so it's, it's a matter of how you say things uh, as much as what, what, you know, without changing your, the actual uh, meaning. But, um, so anyway, I, I think I already talked for too long, uh, but um, uh, thank you very much for, for uh, having invited me and uh, and I hope to uh, be an active member of the CMP and uh, uh, and I hope to support other campaigns coming up. Thank you. shows uh, the kind of consciousness the entire party has gone on to. I think your story is an example to a lot of us. So I just want to say thank you so much again. Um, next up is going to be Aaron, who is actually going to be running for office in the November election coming up. So Aaron. Up here, and I might steal one. Take them, take them. We got tons. Uh, but hello, everyone. Um, I'm here today to not only thank the California National Party for their endorsement of my candidacy, but also rally support for my candidacy for Montebello Unified School District, and also talk about collaboration on uh, rallying support for other candidates in the future. 
uh, right, right now I seek to shed light on some of the problems that we face in the Gold Coast of California and offer a path forward. Um, but first, I'd like to introduce myself and a little bit about me, how I grew up, and why I'm here today. So my name is Darren Rosales. I was born in Boyle Heights. It's one of the east side neighborhoods of Los Angeles. Uh, my environment and experiences have taught me to be a proud Chicano. And I learned of the giants of my past uh, merely just by strolling through my neighborhood and learning about my neighborhood's history. Uh, walking by, um, I still see them today when I visit my dad. Um, my favorite mural in the neighborhood is of Che Guevara. And I also see uh, other murals around me of Zapata, Pancho Villa, Jorge Gonzalez, Cesar Chavez, and Ruben Silva in my um, home neighborhood of Boa Heights, but even where I live now in East LA. Um, today I stand on their shoulders. Uh, I developed politically due to, due to this environment and the strong working class values of my parents that they exemplified throughout my life. Um, my mom always taught me to be a hard worker, you know, stand up for yourself, help out other people who are not as fortunate as you, um, which was all good, but also um, my dad had taught me a lot um, politically, even though I meant to. Um, I would, uh, he would always be on delivery, delivering furniture, and um, I would only get to see my dad on the weekends, and sometimes on Wednesdays. So I would go on these deliveries with him because that would be the only time I'd get to spend time with him. Um, and he would always just give me the newspaper, you know, when he wanted to like relax and uh, not hear a third grade kid just yap about nothing all the time. So he'd be like, hear this, read the California section, read the politics section, and read the business section. And I'd be like, and he would be like, tell me about it after. So I would read it, and I was in third grade at the time, so that was about the time uh, the war on terror is ramping up. So I'd be like, dad, why are we sending soldiers to Iraq? And he's like, well, they're going to say it's for freedom, but really we want resources, and we want to go and be in, put other, be in other people's business. And then I would ask him, hey, I would just ask him so many questions about politics, like why is this this way, why is this that way? And he didn't really have a political background. He didn't really have, he wasn't, he was a registered Democrat, but he wasn't really for Democrats or for any other party. He just told me how him as a working class person, what he thought. And to his surprise, because of all of his explanations, I became a uh, very political, even though now he asked why he's so political, even though he would give me the newspaper and, read, and tell me to read the political section. It's kind of funny. Uh, but today, um, because of that background, um, I'm a social studies teacher in Los Angeles Unified. Uh, I'm a proud union member, and I'm ultimately a proud socialist. Uh, both the school district I work for, LAUSD, and the one that I live in, Montebello Unified, is going through some of the same problems that all districts around California are currently going through. We have overworked and underpaid teachers. Uh, class through, um, their classrooms are overcrowded. And we're faced with continuous attacks on our unions. We're blamed for district and government officials' incompetence. And sometimes it's not even just incompetence. It's just direct uh, malice. Uh, district bureaucracy and school boards, I've come to realize they seem hell-bent on making things worse, not only for us educators, but our students. Uh, they do nothing to solve our teacher shortage that has been, that was pretty bad before the pandemic, but now it's just disgusting. Um, I mean, we see in Florida how they're hiring veterans with no teaching experience at all. And hopefully we don't here get to that point. Um, they are advocating for uh, the staffing of our schools with more police as they take librarians and nurses and teachers and um, special education uh, specialists out of our schools, but they want to bring more police in. And to me, when you uh, pull away resources that actually help children and put in police who most of the time don't really have the best children's um, benefits at heart, 
It's uh, declaring war on our communities, declaring war on our children. And I find that disgusting, because not only do they declare war on our children by pulling away resources, um, they also, the s districts and the government officials, they uh, work together to embezzle millions of dollars from our public education system. I mean, I remember my uh, sister, she told me uh, about how her superintendent got in trouble because he was funneling money away from their lunch program. And I was got how disgusting it is to steal millions of dollars from children, but how horrendous it is to literally be stealing food away from their mouths. And um, I think a very beloved Californian native once said, we have money to, for wars, but we can't feed the poor. And it's really disgusting. But not only do we have this district and public official uh, incompetence, but we now have dist uh, charter schools coming into our working class communities. And really their mission is to extract local tax dollars for a profit. Uh, they're creating spaces where a few select students um, have access to more resources, you know, students who are already probably going to do a good job anyways because they have involved parents, they're already pretty bright, they really don't need these extra resources, they were doing really good on their own. Um, but the rest of the students, the English language learners, the students who have special needs, the students with dyslexia, you know, the student that just can't sit down for 15, 20, 30 minutes straight, that just needs a little bit of a helpful reminder of, to stay focused. Um, students whose parents are work, both working 60 hour weeks, so they don't have time to help their kids uh, with homework to make sure they're actually doing it. Um, those are the kids who need the more resources, but instead they're treating like, they're being treated like second class citizens in our communities. Um, and they were very smart in doing this, the charter schools. Um, they were able to organize conservative forces over decades with the backing of millions of dollars. Uh, they elected pro-charter Republicans and pro-charter Democrats across our state. And not only is all these problems in our schools happening, but there's many problems outside of our schools that directly affect education. Um, I mean, I have students every day who come in, they're tired, they're hungry, they haven't washed their clothes in a week. And they don't have housing, they're living in a car, they're living at an uh, aunt's house, they're going back and forth between different family members or friends, they don't have a stable place to live, they're moving districts and schools all the time. But uh, all, all of those things can be uh, attributed to the poverty that's exploding in our uh, state, in our nation. Uh, so in California, we know it's one of the most expensive states to live in. So many uh, parents are deciding to move to other states where the cost of living is a little bit more affordable, but even there, the costs are increasing. Or other people like uh, myself, uh, me and uh, my partner were putting off having children just because it's so expensive uh, to raise a child, we can barely afford to live ourselves. And this is causing a max uh, exodus of enrollment in our school districts. And many of these school districts are panicking because they know that these funds are gonna be pulled because they're gonna say, well, you don't have as many students, so we need to take some of our money back. As if the decades of defunding of our public education system wasn't enough as to um, decades ago, it was started with Ronald Reagan. But it, even Democrats and other Republicans after him continued this defunding of our education in uh, California. And I really believe that we're coming to a point where we're consolidating and collaborating to fix these problems. I mean, it, it seems easy to say, but it's very hard to do to, to come out and demand that our schools be fully funded, that the workers in those schools have thriving wages so we don't have teachers and counselors and librarians and janitors going to a second job after work and then coming in in the morning exhausted. Um, I've come to work exhausted and I can't teach to my students as well if I'm fully rested. Uh, 
So we need to kick out these private interests of these charter schools who only seek to profit from our working class neighborhoods and uh, remove any politicians, politicians who seek to not only just benefit themselves and their friends and family, but also benefit their donors. Uh, we need to make sure our students come to school ready and to learn to make sure all Californian working families have access to resources to make sure their students are ready. They need to have full access to housing, they need to have health care, they need to have political representation. Um, they also need jobs that pay a thriving wage so they can buy their students uh, school supplies so they can um, properly feed and clothe and get health care for their child. Uh, we need a reorientation of not just our public education system, but our economy so we can meet the needs of the many and not the few. Uh, some may find it surprising or unfathomable, like how can California, the fifth largest economy in the world on its own, uh, be doing so poorly in public education? We lag behind many of the other 49 states. On an international stage, we're completely blown out of the water. I mean, if you look at the other industrialized capitalist nations, we look at Finland, Germany, France, Denmark, um, they put this to shame. And even if we look at the rising socialist nations like China and Vietnam and Cuba, they uh, educate our, their students far better than we do with a lot less resources. Um, I don't find it hard to understand, though. Um, our state is under the supermajority control of the do-nothing Democrats. They have the governor's office, 77% of the state Senate, 75% of the state assembly. And if they were true to their word and champion working class politics like they claim to have, California would be a much better place. And I believe many of us would not be here today. The rest of the state power is captured by the Republican Party who have they ever got their way, we would be stuck in a socially, uh, uh, socially regressive spiral that many other states are currently uh, experiencing. And I'd like to believe most Californians, especially the ones here today or listening, uh, we welcome all, no matter someone's race, ethnicity, religion, gender, or sexual orientation. I fully believe that California is one of the most progressive states, even though there's many things holding us back but that we really do welcome all. Uh, not a simple one, uh, but there's many Californians who support things that we want. Uh, across the state, we want real re poverty reduction programs. Uh, we want housing for all. We want universal health care. We want a world-class education system for our students. And we do want more democratic control of our economy. Uh, many are waking up to this idea of the working class having more control in our economy, uh, as expressed by our two previous speakers. Um, we don't need those who already own more wealth than they can spend in the hundreds of lifetimes to have more of this money. Uh, we see an increased interest of socialism across our country. We see this in the teacher strikes that have been uh, not only in Los Angeles, but it's been going on across the country in the past five years that were only stalled because of the pandemic, but I believe that they will start uh, rising up again. We see this in the rapidly spreading unionizing victories of Amazon and Starbucks across not only our state, but our country. And we also see this in many victories and near victories of those who call themselves socialists. I completely agree with the California National Party's strategy of running candidates, especially local candidates, uh, who will advance many policies that we share, who foster the strengthening of a California identity, um, an identity that we can uh, be proud of to be Californian, because right now I'm not particularly proud of being an American. Uh, we need to work within our communities to make sure that Californians uh, could have a better tomorrow. Um, and I ultimately expend, extend my embrace as a member of the Peace and Freedom Party and hope that the California National Party and many other people uh, join us and the Green Party and uh, our little left community collaboration that's been going on recently so we can consolidate and collaborate uh, further. Because, uh, call me optimistic, but 
I believe that soon uh, many of us are going to start winning uh, local seats and city councils and school boards. Not really play our cards right. We can win state seats, mayoral seats, and really start a political revolution in California. Uh, I'd like to thank the California National Party for doing a great job in supporting local candidates uh, in Long Beach, like Steven Estrada and Carlos Ovalle, who's here, uh, who really fought to represent the working class people of Long Beach and not uh, the Democratic Party or any corporate party or any corporate donors. Um, I think it's important to remember that even if uh, that if we uh, take these seats through organization and struggle, that we should not become comfortable as it will take those seats and further organization and further struggle to make a real impact across our state. And that we need to struggle within our communities for working class power. Um, in my campaign, I started thinking about if I should use like grassroots campaigns that I know many other people say, oh, we're running a grassroots campaign. But I see many Democrats who have the backing of the Democratic Party, who have the backing of Democratic controlled labor unions, who co-opt this message of, oh, we're a grassroots campaign. But they outspend their opponents 10 to 1. And to me, that doesn't seem very grassroots when you have big labor unions, when you have the Democratic Party supporting you. Um, so I'm going forward, and I'm going to call my campaign. It's a working class campaign. It's a working class people campaign. We're working class funders and powers. Um, ultimately, California politics should focus on improving the lives of Californians. We need infrastructure development of our public education, of our railways, of our streets. And our society needs to prioritize uh, the people when now it prioritizes profit. And I and many of us here today take, take steps to change that. And by using the campaign to rally our community behind a program backed by working class power for working class people, if I win my campaign, it can be used as a model for uh, many others uh, for local seats. If not, it's all right. We'll reorganize. We'll learn from our lessons and our, we'll learn from our failures. So hopefully in the future, we will begin to win. So I ask those who are currently not with us, and even you who are with us, to join us for a better California today. for uh, Montebello Unified School Board. So again, it's going to be very exciting to see his campaign, how that plays out. Uh, right now, we're going to take a short break for about, say, 10 to 15 minutes. We have a video segment coming from the rest of the California National Party, Party Executive. Uh, we are a party that is way spread out. We're, California is a big nation state. It's everywhere from Sacramento to San Diego. So again, we're going to have the people from our northern chapter speak as again, they're running for the party executive. So again, we're gonna take about a short 10 minute break. I also do believe that the concession is open as well. So we're just gonna take a quick pause here. Right now, the time of my watch is 11.19, so we'll come back at 11.30. All right, thank you so much. All right, just a reminder, we'll be back in a few minutes. Uh, you're watching this on Red Star Report. And as I said before, the more of you that subscribe, the more people can actually be watching the California National Party 2022 convention. So please, 
hit that subscribe button and uh, we'll be back in just a few minutes. Thank you. One place where I don't want to be co-opted. Um, if you want to take a second tripod for your, for your camera, you can. Uh, this, the other, the other unit is just. You just can't find the Wi-Fi. It's just flipping, flipping, flipping. And I can't find my GoPro. Up, which it shifts this over. Big time.
Uh, once again, we're at the CNP convention 2022. Uh, we're going live on YouTube. So bear with us and we will be back in just a few minutes. Thank you.
the California National Party Convention, 2022. See you in two minutes. Now it's one minute. Yes, or Okay, everyone, welcome back. And uh, just like I said before the break, the California National Party is again a party of a nation state, and we have members all the way from Sacramento to San Diego. Again, it's a very, very big state, so some of the party uh, executives could actually not uh, have the chance to come on down, but they did actually cut a video. So again, you'll see again our new party leadership in just a second. And first one up is Michael Lopes, ran for governor. Uh, he got 25,000 votes in the California recall election that happened uh, last year in September. So we'll hear from him first. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. Sorry I can't be there in person. Uh, I was very much looking forward to it, but just yesterday on Wednesday, as I was getting everything ready to come down to Southern California, uh, my iguana began having some. That's the responsibility when you have an animal. I mean, yes, you heard that right, it's an iguana. She's uh, a little under the weather. Uh, so I'm very sorry I, I can't make it down there in person. I was looking forward to it, especially since we haven't met in person in three years. I was hoping to see everyone again, uh, but it's all right. We'll just do it next year. 2023, which I'm certain will take place. Uh, but I really wanted to show up. I thought it was a good idea to do so, to show up and show my face. Uh, because as you no doubt notice, I am not running this year for re-election as party chair. And I thought it was important that I lay out the personal reasons for this so that people don't get the wrong idea. So let's just be very clear here from the beginning. I've not been kicked out of the party. I have not grown disillusioned with the party or with the movement. Uh, I'm not planning to throw a hissy and wet myself and move to Arkansas. This is not what's going on here. Uh, it's really for much more uh, pragmatic, uh, simple reasons. So first of all, as, as many of you are probably aware, I am a lecturer in political science at San Francisco State University, and enrollment throughout the CSU system uh, in this post-pandemic era is down about 20%, uh, as it is in many places in higher education. Uh, this semester, I'm only teaching two classes, which covers about 80% of my rent. So if I wish to pay the rest of my housing costs, as well as feed myself and the aforementioned animals, that means the second job, which takes away from my ability to chair the California National Party. The party deserves someone who can focus on its organization and growth, as I've sought to do these last three years. But it's a duty I can't fulfill in the way that we present. Secondly, as no doubt fewer of you know, last year before the gubernatorial recall election in which I stood as a candidate, 
my father had a heart attack, in which I am told he was actually dead for a little bit there until he was revived. That next week, September 14th, was the day of the gubernatorial recall election, and it was also my parents' 50th wedding anniversary. My father spent his year in San Francisco at Kaiser, awaiting a triple bypass the next day. So while it's 11 months later, and he's feeling much better now, a reference I'm sure he'd enjoy, for several months, focusing on family issues became a priority. At that time, the leadership committee of the party picked up the slack of a semi-absent chair quite readily because we are an organization with roles, with duties, and responsibilities. We're not simply some group that thinks nasty comments on social media will somehow bring about a better California. We are a group-led organization. The chair is simply the person who tries to keep it all straight. And for me, this organization is key. I took over this role from Theo Slater. And now Sean Forbes will take it over from me, and someone in the future will take that role over from him. We, as the California National Party, endure not because of any particular individual, but because we are a group, united around a common goal. Anyone who thinks the California independence movement was started by a single person who could declare it over at their whim is delusional, naive, or just downright stupid. Such a person isn't looking for a movement. They're looking for a follower. But we don't need to be left by people who aren't even Californians serving their own narcissistic ends. We don't need to be led by anyone else for that matter. The whole point of the movement is that California, as a national and political entity, needs to lead itself. And to be totally clear, nothing in the slightest has changed about my view of the need for this movement or this party. Even if I'm not in active leadership, I'm not going anywhere. I'll still be in the back office managing databases and suggesting policy. I now actually just been over five years since I attended my first DNC convention here in my home in San Francisco. So much has changed in that time, in California, in the United States, in the world, and in our own lives. But despite all these changes, I joined this party because I believe California is being neglected, vilified, and abused by the American federal system and I still believe that 100%. I joined this party because I believe the Democratic Party is not a friend of California, but only serves its own interests of power, domination, and corruption. And I still believe that 100%. I joined this party because I believe that a free and independent California would be good for our people, for the United States and for the world as a whole. And I still believe that 100%. Since my first candidate speech for NorCal chapter coordinator in 2018, I've tried to instill one central point in all listeners. That this party and this movement will succeed not because of our leadership, but because of our membership. Success depends not on what us in the leadership committee do, but what you, the Californians on the ground, will do. If you see a CNP chapter in your county, start one. If there's something you don't like about our platform or that you think needs to be added, join a committee and shape our policy. If you have ideas about our messaging, about how we can reach out to all Californians, especially in rural areas, and marginalized communities historically ignored by Sacramento, then get active and get that message out there. Instead, in my campaign last year, I received almost 20,000 votes, 26,000 votes, in fact, is what they said. That's not entirely true. 
almost nobody voted for me because they thought Michael Lowe was such a great guy. I don't have that many friends. People voted for our message. They're sick and tired of a California in which nothing gets done by the federal vacuopoly, where democratic competition is largely non-existent in most places, where regional and ideological battles 3,000 miles away are given priority over cleaning up our own house. Californians are hungry for a party that offers solutions, not partisan rhetoric. A party that actually cares about us as Californians. Let's not allow ourselves to fall into the trap of being a left, center, or right wing party. Let's not fall into the trap of being an urban or rural party. We need to be and remain a California party. That's our selling point. That's what we can offer that no one else in California politics is offering right now. We're lucky because California sells itself. I've said it for years and I still believe it. We have the best product that we can possibly sell. California. It's our job, the job of everyone listening to this, to make this party a reality. Even before independence, California needs to have a party that actually works for California. With your help, and only with your help, the California National Party can be that party. So I would like to thank everyone for these three years as the California National Party Chair. I look forward to hopefully seeing you all next year at the 2023 convention, if not sooner. I apologize again for not being there, and I apologize again for my 10-year-old laptop camera. But thank you. My family thanks you. Iguana thanks you. And I think California thanks you. That was Michael Loeb's. We did a fantastic job with zero resources, basically, to get 26,000 votes. For Hello, my name. And that's a lot behind me. Uh, we're going to be switching over to the party executives who are actually running for election for party office. Now, you can actually go online and actually vote for them. Again, there is an online ballot. Um, again, like a, a website you can go to is CMP. Dot CF backslash LC dash elections dash 2022. And that's where you could actually put down if you agree or disagree with the candidate slate that CMP has provided. So next up is Ivana Hargo. You probably know her from uh, last year when she was actually secretary. And now she's going to be the vice chair if she has her vote. So here's her statement. Hello, my name is Yvonne Hargrove. I'm excited to be considered for election as vice chairperson of the California National Party. I've previously served as party secretary and I heartily endorse David Liskier for party secretary. David has contributed so much to the party from participating in platform revisions to organizing our participation in the San Francisco Pride Parade this year. His dedication to the party and the skills he will bring to the role or why I encourage you to vote for David for secretary. If elected as vice chair, I will continue to improve the party, support coordination of volunteers, assist with fundraising, and support general projects to help the party reach its goals. I support California independence because the United States is barreling toward fascism at an alarming rate. This is the first generation of women in the US to have less rights than the generation before them. And you know it won't stop there. Women's rights, gun control, separation of church and state, and protection of the environment have all been dismantled in the blink of an eye. What's next? 
and genuinely concerned about California's ability to protect itself from an increasingly fascist U.S. government. And to those who say the Democrats will save the United States, I say, what have they done for you lately? I love California and everyone who lives in our great nation, and I believe we all deserve to have our fundamental human rights be protected. That is why I believe California must be independent of the United States and why I support the California National Party. Thank you. Again, that was fun. Uh, we will be putting up at the end of the actual convention the link to the actual place to actually put uh, down whether or not you want to have her or have her not be the actual vice chair. Uh, next, Lescour, uh, David is proposing himself as the secretary, and he's been doing a great job already. Um, all the videos and everything that you see up here has been pretty much edited by David. So we'll see a video from him. Hi, I'm David Lesky, and I'm running for party secretary. I'm a born Californian, and I have never lived anywhere else, nor would I even want to. I was raised by the diverse culture that is made up by all who call this land home, and I was educated at a California community college and at UC Davis. While I have lived nowhere else, I have traveled enough to see the natural beauty of the US and some of its people. However, its cacophonous pseudo-democratic political system has destroyed all of my emotional connections to the country that occupies my homeland. As a member of the CNP, I have assisted in many projects, including drafting of press releases and editorial responses, party communications and political campaigning, I've helped with social media, online presence, and fundraising, as well as help the CMP participate at its first Pride Parade in San Francisco this year. I hope you choose to vote for me, David Leskier, for Party Secretary for California. Again, that was David. Uh, another interesting fact, too, is that David uh, helped us get into the San Francisco Pride Parade, and funny enough, we we're actually the only political party in that actual Pride Parade. Uh, that didn't show up, neither did anyone else. Woo! So, uh, next up is going to be uh, Lara Procasi. Uh, she's been our longtime treasurer, and she's running for re election. And she's already been doing a great job, so we all hope that you keep her on. And thank you so much for attending the California National Party Convention. I really do apologize for not being able to deliver this speech to you in person, but I am drinking mimosas on the deck of a cruise ship off the coast of Alaska at the time that you're watching this recording. So, <clears throat> as anyone who has attended these conventions before will know, I enjoy spicing up my election speeches with fun facts about this amazing nation that we live in. If anyone thinks that I'm talking about the US, you're in the wrong place. I'm talking about California, the California nation, and my love, awe, respect, and hopes for its future. I am running for re-election as treasurer of the California National Party, and I promise that I will get to the boring parts of that process shortly. But let's begin with some of that fun factiness that I mentioned before. First, California is the avocado capital of the world. I'm sure lots of folks already knew this, but we're starting easy and working our way up. Our Central Valley is also the almond capital of the world. A uh, fun fact about almonds, when eaten right off the tree, they're actually poisonous, and anything about 10 of those will fill your body with cyanide. Yay. Don't worry, though. <laughs> All almonds commercially sold have been heated to high enough temperatures to denature the toxin. 
yes, even raw almonds. So I'm starting my speech with a little danger of that. Second, the Hollywood Bowl is the largest outdoor amphitheater in the United States. When it opened in 1922, it was merely a simple wooden platform with a canvas top. In my college years, I saw Tori Amos perform there, and the guy next to me vomited. Good times. Third, the world's largest tree is named General Sherman, and it lives in Sequoia National Park at nearly 275 feet tall and a circumference of 102 feet. It's about 2,200 years old. That means I was in high school when it was uh, first terminated. See, these are the bad jokes. Anyway, fourth, Death Valley is the hottest, driest, and lowest national park in the U.S. You can't even make it from your hotel room door to the swimming pool without heat stroke. Believe me, I've tried. Fifth, California is the birthplace of the internet, skateboards, Barbie dolls, blue jeans, arcade games, McDonald's, wetsuits, Apple products, Frisbee, fortune cookies, and many more. Uh, yeah, it's, I could go into the history of each and every one of those, but we don't have enough time for that. Sixth, the famous windows wallpaper of rolling green hills on a bright blue sky is a photo taken in Sonoma County, California and it is completely unedited. Take that, Photoshop. Seventh, in the summer months, the Sierra Nevada surprises and delights visitors with its magnificent watermelon snow. As a result of microscopic algae, pink-tinted snow drapes the mountains, and some even say it smells and tastes just like watermelon. Don't eat the little black seeds in it, though. Those might be rabbit pellets. Yeah. <clears throat> anyway, eighth, California defies gravity, literally. There are several mysterious places in California where gravity just doesn't seem to play the same role as it should. Hills in certain spots of California are known to push your car uphill without using any power and while the car is in neutral. So to the laws of physics, we say, go take a flying leap. And now for some facts specifically about San Francisco, because San Francisco is just that unique. One, there are more dogs than children in San Francisco. The primary reason is that the cost of living in San Francisco is so extreme, even for tech workers who make a good amount of money. The idea of expanding their families isn't very appealing when money doesn't go very far in the city. So instead, people adopt pets. Number two, in 1964, San Francisco's cable cars were named the first moving national historic landmark. The San Francisco cable cars are the only ones still operating in a U.S. city. In my case, those things are critical to survival because my knees will not walk up and down those hills. Lombard Street, am I right? Yeah. Three, even though the rice a jingle calls it the San Francisco treat, that product was originally built in Oakland. So Oakland makes up for what it lacks in football skills with a yummy and popular side dish for your pork chops. Four, thousands of visitors flock to the gold bridge every year, and some wonder why it is not actually golden. It is painted with a burnt red-orange color of primer to protect it from the corrosive elements and weather. Without that, it would become the golden pile of metal chunks sticking out of the water underneath it. And nobody wants that. Number five, and I have just lost my place. Please allow me to catch it again. Number five, during the Great Depression, San Francisco su successfully survived the worldwide recession. None of its banks went bankrupt during this time. If this isn't further proof that California needs its own banking system, I don't know what is. Six, San Francisco is the only city where you can walk on guns, yes, guns, in an attempt to make the city streets free of mud and dirt, 
Settlers paved the streets with guns during the late 1800s, early 1900s. You know, the guns that they kind of weren't using at the time. Seven, it is better than automobiles in garages in San Francisco. This begs the question, do Hot Wheels count? And finally, I would like to finish with how California exemplifies the concept of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And I apologize to anyone if they find this inappropriate, but here I go. California is home to almost 40 million people, which is the reason we have needed far more representation in the US government than we have actually had for many decades now. High population happens from sex, ultimately. California grows more than 3.3 million tons of wine grapes on over 540,000 acres each year and produces roughly 90% of all U.S. wine. Wine is a popular and rightly regulated drug. You know, technically. California has over 500 fault lines, which are, of course, the source locations of earthquakes. Southern California has about 10,000 earthquakes each year, although only 15 to 20 of them have a magnitude greater than four. On average, all of the California experiences over 100,000 earthquakes a year. And that's what I call rock and roll. All right, all right, I get it. I'm trying my best with these jokes and analogies. People, give me a break. Now, we can finally cover the foreign stuff. I have been treasurer of the California National Party since I joined it over five years ago. So far, we have not yet been taken to court for millions of dollars, which is more than I can say for John and Deb. Thus, I suppose I've been doing something right. I absolutely love being able to help this amazing political party with anything and everything they need. And I cannot stomach the idea of having to train someone else in my bookkeeping system. Trust me, it works, but all I can say is that there is madness to my method. But anything is better than QuickBooks, and yes, I'm still complaining about QuickBooks. <clears throat> anyway, please vote to re-elect me, Lira Porcasi, as the treasurer of the California National Party. I'll keep the numbers straight, even the curvy ones. <laughs> Thank you <laughs> for California. Put up the link at the end of the convention so again you can look at the entire slate but we have other candidates uh, from bakersfield actually we have bradley smith here uh, who is going to be uh, the coordinator position so bradley Sean. Uh, as was stated, my name is Bradley Smith. Um, I'm a resident of the San Joaquin Valley of Central California. I was born and raised in Bakersfield. Um, having been born and raised there, I've been able to see the conditions that the agricultural workers of our state are forced to operate in, the way that the wealth produced by Capitalized on by the private agribusinesses that dominate that industry. Um, the California National Party, to me, seems an excellent way to drive change within our communities. Having an independent California would allow us to direct the abundance of resources that we have in the state and produce in the state toward domestic programs and the people here who make it possible. Um, we would also be able to fund more socially progressive measures here at home instead of 
having to dedicate all of those resources or give them up to Washington, D.C. and the private corporations of this country. Um, we do have the sixth largest economy in the entire world, so as a Californian, that is something that makes me very proud. Um, fifth largest. <laughs> fifth largest? There it is, fifth largest, even better. The people of California deserve their fair share. We won't be able to get that until we demand it. And I think that the threat of California independence is enough to get people to listen to us. And ultimately, if that's what it takes, then that's what it takes to get us to take care of ourselves. I think that we are capable of taking care of ourselves and that we should not rely on the outside forces to dictate what we should be doing here at home. Um, the California National Party has the vision of an equitable California, free from the exploitation and abuse of Washington, D.C. and the private corporations, who many of which made their wealth here in the first place. We only need to come together and join the party, reach out to others, you know, get people to expand their imagination, learn to ask for more, and we can we can make that vision a reality. Thank you. I'm going to keep it brief. Many others have already hit the main beats, so I think that's good enough. Thank you very much. All right, so that is our slate that will be Propose and you can actually vote online. We'll put up that link again at the end of the convention. Uh, but right now, it is about 12.06, so we're going to take a half hour lunch break. Uh, Native Ale is upstairs, that is a restaurant. Across the street is Detention, which I believe might be open at this hour, and then there's also another Mexican place that's down the way. So I've got plenty of great food here in downtown Santa Ana, and we'll be back in, in about a half hour, so we'll say 12.40. Thank you so much. All right, we're going to be taking a 30 minute break. Again, I'll remind you, uh, hit that subscribe button to make sure that everybody who wants to see this can see this. We will be um, editing this and putting it back out as Red Star Report and making it available for the California National Party uh, sh uh, shortly after the conclusion of the convention. And for everybody watching, all you Red Star Rebels, thank you, thank you, thank you for watching. It's the California National Party 2022, and we'll be back in about half an hour. Yeah. 